This video was made possible by Wix. If you are ready to create a website, head over to wix.com slash go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. The Aircraft Carrier, an iconic symbol of naval might for the last 75 years. In essence, a mobile airfield, aircraft carriers can bring to bear the firepower of a small air force onto an enemy with or near a coastline. Yet with new weapons, such as hypersonic missiles being developed by nations around the world, is the aircraft carrier being made obsolete? That's what we'll find out today. In this episode of the Infographic Show, do we still need aircraft carriers? A modern aircraft carrier is equipped with up to 90 aircraft, ranging from fighters, strike aircraft, air tankers, airborne early warning and control aircraft, anti-submarine helicopters, and electronic warfare aircraft. This represents a formidable amount of firepower in just one platform, but also a potentially crippling liability. With crews of up to 6,000 personnel, the loss of just a single aircraft carrier would represent double the casualties of the entire American war in Afghanistan. But how did carriers get their start, and how exactly did they come to trump battleships as the flagships of a modern navy? The first prototype aircraft carrier was developed by today's carrier superpower, the United States of America. During its civil war of 1861 to 1865, both the Union and the rebel Confederates used observation balloons to conduct reconnaissance of enemy positions. The chief aeronaut of the Union Army Balloon Corps, Professor Thaddeus S. C. Lowe, oversaw the conversion of a coal barge into a floating dock for hot air balloons. From this barge, the professor launched the first waterborne aerial sortie in history by ascending and then returning on his hot air balloon. His success would go on to see the development of balloon carriers around the world, with 10 of these vessels seeing service across the militaries of Great Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Russia, and Sweden. Tasked with aerial reconnaissance, the balloon carriers had practically no offensive capabilities. World War I would see the first use of airplanes launched from ships in combat. With the development of the seaplane in 1910, navies around the world converted their balloon carriers to seaplane carriers. Lowered to the water via a crane, the seaplane would then take off and land back in open water, be scooped back up via crane, and stored aboard its home ship. Initially, these aircraft were also used for reconnaissance and for spotting fire for other ships, helping guide the guns of battleships and destroyers closer on target. In September 1914 though, during the Battle of Tsingtao, the Imperial Japanese Navy became the first military in the world to conduct a successful naval-launched air raid. Launching four seaplanes from the Wakamiya, the planes bombarded German forces and returned to be retrieved. Two months later, the tactic was copied by the British, who had been present at the Battle of Tsingtao, when they launched 12 seaplanes against the German Zeppelin base at Cuxhaven. While not as numerous as seaplane carriers, the first flat decks, true forerunners of today's iconic supercarriers, also saw service during World War I. The United States was the first nation to launch and land an airplane directly from a naval ship. These first true aircraft carriers were limited to small, light aircraft with few armaments, and as such were mostly used for scouting, spotting fire for Allied ships, and attacks on vulnerable Zeppelins which were in wide use throughout the war. It was World War II, however, that would see the carrier usurp the large gun battleship as the premier naval combatant. After the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, American officials feared that the Pacific Fleet had been hopelessly crippled with all of America's Pacific-based battleships sunk or damaged. Yet the Japanese attack had neither destroyed nor damaged a single American carrier, and six months later, the Battle of Midway showed the world that the battleship was, in essence, obsolete, and the Americans quickly reversed course on reconstructing their battleship fleet to creating new aircraft carriers. With their complement of air power, the aircraft carrier has unmatched firepower, situational awareness, and accuracy, and for over 75 years has reigned supreme in navies around the world. Yet today, many defense industry analysts and military leaders are questioning the wisdom of continuing to operate these behemoth ships. Why? The biggest nail in the carrier's coffin is the steady march of technology, most notably in the realm of anti-ship hypersonic and ballistic missiles. Aegis-equipped escort ships, such as the American Arleigh Burke destroyers, are the first line of defense against both these threats. An Arleigh Burke destroyer is equipped with AN Spy-1 search and tracking radar and AN SPG-62 fire control radar used to identify, track, and hone defensive missiles on target. An attacker would fire missiles programmed to fly low to the water and use the curvature of the Earth to avoid Aegis radar, though they would have to occasionally pop up and activate their own radars to locate their targets and fix their trajectory. 
These occasional pop-ups would give plenty of warning to Aegis of an incoming attack, but by keeping their flight path low and close to the water, Aegis AN Spy-1 radar would not be able to achieve an intercept lock until the incoming missiles crossed the radar horizon 15 miles away. At this time, the Aegis vessel would launch its first wave of interceptors. The hypersonic anti-ship missiles, moving at Mach 2-3, would reach their target in about 33 seconds. But as most attack missiles are programmed to conduct erratic maneuvers to try and shake off interceptors, this would add a few seconds to interception time. American Arleigh Burke destroyers are equipped with the MK-41 vertical launch cell system, allowing them a firing rate of 10 missiles every 10 seconds. With each incoming missile being assigned two interceptors, each Aegis vessel could at best try to intercept 15 missiles. This represents a serious problem for aircraft carriers, as an enemy air attack of 16 to 20 strike aircraft could very quickly overwhelm a carrier group's Aegis defense network with volleys of four missiles per aircraft for a total of 64 to 80 missiles. Ballistic missiles provide a different but equally deadly threat. While a carrier could protect itself from anti-ship hypersonic missile attack by ensuring air superiority and sending its own strike aircraft against enemy ships, ballistic missiles can be launched from hundreds or even thousands of miles away, safely out of reach of any carrier-based aircraft and typically from platforms deep in well-defended enemy territory. While technically easier to defend against than anti-ship missiles due to their mostly predictable trajectories and sheer size, nations such as China have turned ballistic missiles into a deadly threat to American carriers via sheer numbers alone. With thousands of missiles in its inventory, the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force could easily oversaturate an American carrier's defensive measures operating in the Pacific all the way from deep inside China itself. The loss of even just a single supercarrier would mean a loss of life not seen in one day's worth of combat since the end of World War II and dwarf the total casualties of most conflicts since. Billions of dollars of hardware and thousands of lives could be snuffed out in a single attack, severely testing the resolve of any nation's will to continue fighting. While most anti-carrier weapons carry a complex kill chain of assets such as satellites, radar tracking stations, and command and control hubs that can all be neutralized and upset to prevent a successful attack, it is clear that improvements in missile technologies is very quickly making carriers a potential liability. Many defense insiders and military officials have begun calling for a change in naval doctrine and a move to smaller, more dispersed, and thus more survivable light aircraft carriers, pointing out that the loss of a single light carrier would mean only the loss of a fraction of a fleet's total air power. In the end, only time will tell, though we can only hope that it will not take a military tragedy to dictate naval doctrine for the next 75 years. Speaking of tech tragedies, have you looked at your website recently? If you had gone with Wix, you'd have one less thing to worry about today. Wix is an absolutely amazing platform for anybody, whether you're a Marine, a YouTuber, a professional meme creator, or even a professional website builder. You'll never have to worry if your website is safe and secure, or if it will go down because you've been using some other provider. You can finally create that amazing website that you've always been thinking about and support the infographic show at the same time by going to wix.com go slash infographics or by clicking the link in the description. Don't wait until it's too late. Get a head start today with the amazing website you deserve. So, do you think aircraft carriers are still a useful tool or are they too much of a liability? How would the US even react to the loss of 6,000 lives in a single attack? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called Smallest Aircraft Carrier in the World. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.